and can you use the one that works? One of them shows the one of them does not show. This one shows what happens after sometimes one of them gets disconnected. Nobody, no battery is both. Okay, so today uh, uh, I'm reviewing deep medicine uh, book uh, uh, by Dr. Uh, Eric Topo. Uh, so, uh, so this is the author biography. So Dr. Uh, Eric Topo is a practicing cardiologist with Scripps Clinic. He is also teaching a genomics in uh, Scripps uh, uh, Center. And his expertise in the cardiovascular disease, uh, he has completed uh, is MD from University of Western School of Medicine. And uh, like he has uh, more certification uh, from American Board of Internal Medicine Cardiology uh, 1985 and the Board of Internal Medicine uh, in 1982. And he's interested in uh, genomics, wireless sensors, uh, preventive cardiology, including heart attack. Uh, coronary artery disease and uh, around it, like he has more than uh, 300,000 citations and uh, uh, and it is like uh, so based on my analysis it is increasing 25 to 30,000 every year so uh, in this book uh, uh, so Dr. Uh, Eric Topol uh, has uh, talked about uh, current challenges uh, <coughs> The current healthcare systems uh, and uh, what we can do to improve the current healthcare and uh, introducing the personalized care and uh, he is talking about patient centric care as well and how AI can potentially address uh, healthcare challenges by providing uh, more precise and personalized diagnosis and treatments. So uh, I will uh, explain uh, about the, the value-based care. So, what is the patient-centric care? What is the so right now? The what is the what is happening with the uh, healthcare system? It is like money-oriented thing. So, there are two different models. One is a fee-for-service, and one is the value-based care. So, I will explain it as well uh, 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 in the later slides. Uh, and uh, so, in this uh, introduction chapter, he is also like talking about a number of uh, new algorithms over the time. What are the like different uh, number of publications over the time? So it is like improving and uh, uh, talks about uh, the industrial revolution as well, like deep learning, uh, machine learning, deep learning, and those things. And uh, like he he is putting question marks. So uh, from all of these various medicine. So. High level, so these are the uh, different uh, building blocks. We can say these are the entities or uh, group of people which are involved in the current healthcare system. So, so starting from patient, so once like okay, patient will go to any hospital uh, first. He will go to PCP and then specialist. He can go to urgent care, emergency, right? So these are the uh, the second level building blocks and uh, so what is happening uh, so once patient will go to any hospital or any any physician right so physician will discuss with the patient he will review the historical data first and then he will talk with the patient and then after uh, so after the visit he will dictate uh, so in the older system he will dictate okay so this is the history of the patient these are the chief complaints these are the medication those stuff so that recording file will go to the medical transcriptionist and medical uh, so MT people will uh, listen that audio and they will transcribe the report and because like we have uh, the insurance uh, practice uh, in place so they need to prepare each and every documentation uh, uh, with like all all the conversation with the patient and if it is uh, inpatient then they need to uh, routinely uh, routine visit they need to uh, record that as well Akshit, what is PCP and EHR? PCP is primary care provider. Okay. And EHR? Electronic health records. So once they have the record, so even in that uh, the third uh, block uh, that I'm talking about, so 
so currently medical transcription thing is like going down because there are new algorithms coming up for speech to text so there are front end uh, speech recognition tools are available and uh, physician is uh, like dictating in the front end speech only and they are uh, modifying the content if the algorithm is not properly working then they will modify something and prepare the documentation so after uh, we have like each and every records each and every uh, documentation for patient then they need to uh, do the medical coding so there is another team uh, in hospital or they are outsourcing the work uh, for medical coding and billing so so from the unstructured document what they will do they will assign the medical codes so because uh, they cannot uh, submit all the documents unstructured documents to the uh, insurance companies to get the payment so here the practice is uh, to assign the medical codes so until 2014 there were uh, there was icd9 coding system was in the practice and after i think 2015 uh, all the hospitals and uh, the entire healthcare uh, system is focusing on the icd10 and they are right now coding and billing is happening with icd10 so if we talk about uh, that complexity uh, so uh, in icd9 uh, so until 2014 so they have around uh, total 15000 15 16000 codes includes uh, diagnosis and treatments but if we talk about icd10 it is uh, uh, so uh, around 160000 codes uh, including uh, diagnosis and uh, treatments so uh, the complexity is we can talk about the like 20x or uh, around 20x so now they need uh, the software of computer assisted coding so now uh, there are so many companies are building computer assisted coding software so they need to purchase that as well uh, to get the correct medical codes because it is very difficult for human to remember each and everything each and every codes like for this diagnosis this combination this is the code uh, if uh, there is another diagnosis in addition then the code will change so right now uh, they need to also invest in computer assisted coding and as well as uh, there is a, a other process which is clinical documentation improvement which i, I did not mention i forgot it but uh, there is another process clinical <coughs> documentation improvement where uh, uh, so let me tell you some example for uh, so ejection fraction less than 30% is mentioned in the document right so which means like the patient has a systolic heart failure but uh, by uh, mistake physician has mentioned only heart failure for example so there is a different payment for only heart failure and there is a different payment associated with the systolic heart failure so if you like have more specific thing then the payment will change based on the specific diagnosis so again uh, there is another process clinical documentation improvement there are companies who are building clinical documentation improvement uh, they have uh, some algorithm they will uh, prioritize uh, different patient cases based on the documentation and they will uh, they will highlight okay these are the uh, entities these are the information mentioned in the document and you need to recommend systolic not the uh, only unspecified heart failure so 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 that, that is that process and based on that again medical coding will uh, change and uh, they will submit that data to insurance companies and insurance yeah, what is that cms thing center of medicare and medicaid services ah, what do they do so cms uh, so uh, <laughs> okay so <laughs> so yeah the big kahuna <laughs> right right we, we don't know that. Oh, well, very, very you, you, yeah, you don't know, but I, I can tell you, they're the big community here. Yes. So uh, CMS, so uh, we have like, uh, uh, so patient uh, ages, let's say more than 60, then uh, government takes to provide the insurance, right? So CMS is that like, okay, uh, if you have. Government. Huh? The government. Government. The government. Yeah. Government. And the, the, government, the government. The government is basing their standards on treating old people like me. Right. Uh, and, and. that filters down into the entire rest of the healthcare system. right and the, why would you get to 
so cms uh, has introduced many different regulations as well that hospital needs to follow uh, all the all the people need to follow that and there are even is there a regulatory body or executive body what kind of uh well they handle all the billing they handle all the billing they inspect all the bills that come through on the on behalf of the old people and they say uh you know this is the amount of money that we're going to reimburse for this kind of problem and that so kind of vigilance organization kind of yeah, but they also, you know, they they will. That is a payer. They will pay. They do pay for me because I'm old. Um, but but then that cost structure filters down into the cost structure for nice, young, healthy people like you guys. Right. So. So I will talk about that as well. There are two different <laughs> models. One is. Yeah. <laughs> huh? No, no, no. Yeah. So yeah, there are two models. One is fee for service, and one is value based. Yeah. yeah. So I will talk about that. What are the differences between these two models? And uh, so even like there are different entities are also involved. Uh, for example, clearing house. So they will, I think, act between a hospital and insurance companies because they need to uh, do something that they will verify or something. So sometimes insurance company has also like they will outsource uh, uh, the things to verify. And and uh, so those type of contracts that they are doing. With other Another uh, curiosity question I have read: uh, there is a <coughs> emerging area called personalized medicine, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Looking at the genetics and etc., the medicine will be personalized. So will you will you also talk about it? No. Yeah. So uh, uh, author has also talked about. Uh, uh, so his vision is this, right? So his. Uh, uh, so in entire book, he will talk about the current challenges and what is his vision. Uh, so vision about uh, the personalized care, the uh, virtual uh, uh, AI uh, assistant, so all of this and where uh, the AI algorithm can fit in different, uh, okay, medical imaging. Uh, Basically, the whole spectrum. Yeah, so whole did, spectrum. Did they mention concierge medicine? Did he mention concierge medicine? Which that person? doesn't ring a bell. Concierge, C-O-N-S-E-I-R-G-E. -E. Concierge. Yeah. No? Didn't come up. No, it, 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 this one. It didn't come up. Okay. Just it curious. That it's a quality measure report. What? So quality measure is another thing. So uh, there are quality measures, for example, yes. if you are going with, let's say, a heart, a heart uh, disease, then they need, so hospital needs to follow a measure. Okay, so yeah. in 24 hours or in two hours, you need to give aspirin to mm -hmm. the patient. So those are the guidelines. No, no, no. CMS, like according to what I'm seeing here, it's doing like quality measures of the reports. Yeah. To support patient-centered uh -huh. system. Uh, uh, so <laughs> no. remember, guys, so, now we have only 45 minutes. Yeah. We have power to. And uh, let's focus more on AI side of it. I know that some operational healthcare is valuable, but we just won't have time to yeah, but to understand like what are the different challenges, if you understand okay, what is the current system, then it is better. Yeah, this, like, this personalization uh, decide, issue. Decide what you can do best. Yeah. Uh, keeping in mind we are technical people in 45 minutes. Right. Well, right. The, the, the is not here, they're not here, they're not just the people of the box. What? If is not there, they're not just the people of the box. I don't know if Mutkani is not here. Oh, our, our other presenter, you mean? Yeah, no. is, is, she, is she here? Is she, is she I, I don't think so. She's joining. Oh, it's... she is joining, or you don't think she's, she's joining? Not. Okay. Did she mention that? Dr. Shin, she's not been joining from last oh. few. Sorry? She's not joining from last few sessions. So, oh. but did, he, did somebody sign for her? Did she say she's going to join? There is a slot for Dr. Shin today. Does she know that? I don't know. Like it's on the she yeah, dashboard. Own. Yeah, so. so why don't you just send on LinkedIn message? So, so because of this, all this regulation and all this practice that they need to do, uh, so the cost is uh, increasing. Uh, uh, the healthcare cost is increasing, and this is the data which is mentioned in the book. Like uh, uh, the author is comparing the cost uh, uh, in 1975 uh, to like currently. So currently, meaning like 2017 or 18, where the book book is published. So you can see the number, like number of healthcare jobs in, uh, in 1975, 4 million, and now it is more than 16 million. Uh, and uh, the spending per person is like, uh, you can see like uh, from 550, so currently it is more than 11,000. 
<clears throat> the important point for us is the standardization of healthcare mm -hmm. against which we, you know, we want to pull away from that. We want personalized. So that's what's important here. Right, right, right. So, uh, so, so now you can understand why the cost is like uh, way high, uh, like it is increasing because there are uh, so many regulations coming uh, every day and uh, they need to uh, hire different, uh, like they need to uh, get different software, they need to outsource something and uh, to just meet with the regulation. And yeah, so this is the just a highlight of what is fee for service and what is value based care. So author is only so in entire is is talking about the patient centric care, like how uh, so currently if you see uh, hospitals and physicians are incentivized based on the the data that they are presenting, right? So uh, fee for service model, but CMS is like moving from fee for service to value based care. So and how they are doing? So they will uh, so from your all the historical data from let's say one year uh, historical data, they will uh, identify the risk score, and based on the risk score, they have uh, the model. Okay, this is the risk score, and this is the amount that, that they will give. So uh, they will fix the amount per patient based on the historical data and uh, uh, like getting the risk score for that patient. And uh, they will incentivize uh, physician and the hospital uh, because it's a fixed fixed spot. Whatever you do, doesn't matter. So you need to treat a patient so that you uh, like you can save the cost from your side because we are going to give let's say ten thousand dollar for this patient. Doesn't matter what. Uh, so it is a one visit, two visit, three visit, whatever you can, uh, uh, you want to do, you do. But this is the fixed cost uh, for this particular patient. So that is CMS is uh, uh, doing uh, with the insurance companies and uh, physicians. And there are uh, advantages as well, uh, like for the value-based care. Uh, so it is like mentioned. For <laughs> And then uh, uh, the author is uh, talking about the shallow medicine approach, which is like current healthcare system uh, that uh, they are doing. And uh, also talked about the medical diagnosis, which is like the another chapter. Uh, but here uh, he's talking about the limitations of traditional medical practices. And uh, he like need a more personalized data driven approach uh, to healthcare. <laughs> And in, in this uh, chapter, uh, he is like talking about uh, different uh, 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 met methods, like how uh, current healthcare system, how physicians are approaching uh, to the patient. So they are uh, treating symptoms rather than the underlying causes of illness, and uh, which leads to the misdiagnosis, mistreatment, and harm uh, patient. And, he has also mentioned a few examples, uh, the story about how the misdiagnosis is happening uh, uh, in this uh, healthcare practice. And uh, so the second point, 12 million uh, significant misdiagnosis a year. So this is the number uh, which is mentioned in the uh, uh, book. So which is a few, like the 12 million uh, misdiagnosis uh, and we, if we have a proper practice, then uh, we can reduce that number. Out of what? Out of how many diagnoses? I'm not so sure I care about this number. Sorry? I'm not so sure I care about this number. Out of what? 300 million? <laughs> Three, 400 million diagnoses per year? I mean, yeah. misdiagnosis. So, yeah, but out of what? How many percent? Yeah, out of what? 2% or only 20%? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know about yeah. what the be careful in the interpretation of these data. I mean, yeah, 12 million mess diagnosis sounds terrible, but you know, if it's like uh, mm -hmm. you know, 0.01%, I'm I'm not so sure I care. <laughs> and, uh, is this number recorded over uh, healthcare systems in the US? Yes. Yeah, this is yes. I think this, this is, is health US. US. Yeah, 330 million, and you know, that they, they go to the doctor twice a year, and you know, I mean, I don't know how much I care about this number. Yeah, and they about the disadvantages of the practice of shallow medicine, which will lead to like uh, extraordinary ways or suboptimal outcomes, unnecessary harms. So those points that he has discussed in the book, and uh, uh, in in the summary, like okay, he's uh, talking about okay, we need personalized approach. Each patient has the unique needs and concerns. so what you talk about based on the the 
personalize history, history data and uh, you know stuff how we can uh, do the personalize uh, What's the matter? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, this is uh, the word uh, cloud uh, which, which describes the doctor. So, uh, uh, so this is the <laughs> data like, okay, so these are the, posit uh, the positive. Uh, so, this is the basically sentiment like how people are thinking about the physician, right? So you can see the positive uh, word cloud. So they have like very uh, good data about the positive thing. And uh, you, you can see there are so many uh, different vocabularies. And uh, yeah. I think uh, something similar we also saw in uh, COVID analysis. <laughs> when there were riots against <coughs> the yeah. Yeah, and these are the different uh, uh, data that uh, he has discussed in the book. So this is the life expectancy uh, versus uh, the expenditure uh, on the patient. And this, I think this is the data from 1970 to 2015. So he's comparing the other countries and where the United States. Does not have India. <laughs> they, have, uh, they have compared with 19 uh, countries. So, don't have so it's a group. You don't? A lot of people. Yeah, a lot of people, but, uh, but people are not that organized to give this. Data program. is not there. <laughs> For India, you, you will not get the data. <laughs> okay. Because the you know, Indian healthcare is not uh, on totally on the insurance side, right? So there is no need to prepare the uh, oh, all people the documentation. Don't yeah, documentation like, yeah. yeah. That's the they are not very. <laughs> and uh, so uh, again, this is another information, uh, uh, infant and child mortality. Uh, so this is the group, uh, Deepa, o OECD 19. I don't know what countries are there, but uh, there are 19 countries uh, uh, there they are comparing. Comparing with US. Uh, so this is a group of countries. And, and that is, compared to those I am guessing me. That is US. That is, I am guessing mean of those countries. What? Mean OECD countries. Yes. Uh, US, Costa Rica, France. I think all the South Korea, Chile, Germany, UK, Denmark. There's, there's 30 something okay. in here. Uh, is there in India? No. no. I'm curious. It is. It's always I see you know, the life expectancy is quite higher in the Eastern Asian countries, Japan, China, yeah. Korea. Yeah, because and I their guess. Their food habit? Huh? Their food habit, their lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's a really important point. Yeah. yeah, we can see the data here, but it, but you know, attributing this to the structure of our healthcare system is questionable. It might be something else. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is again maternal mortality numbers, which is like uh, awful. Very uh, very high yeah. in the other countries. Why is that? Why is that? Why is so? So that's why, like he's uh, like mentioning all the different challenges, and uh, uh, and uh, so these are the just information like where uh, the uh, we need to improve to personalized care and patient oriented care rather than doing the fee for service model those kind. Of. But I just came across a news piece today that uh, maternal mortality rate for the year 2022 was uh, higher than the one higher than the number in 2021 by 40 percent. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I, I'm, I'm guessing it's a couple of things, but one of them is going to be prenatal care. Yes. Um, and there are other issues, but that's going to be a big one. That was alarming. It's very alarming. This number is a one out of a thousand, or what is it? Well, you see the x, y axis. <coughs> probably 10,000. Like? Probably. It's probably 10,000, probably. Not a set of percentage. Yeah. yeah. No, it's not. No, no. no we're not having well, 26%. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't think so. 26% is like No, it would it wouldn't be that high. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then in, in medical diagnosis, uh, like he's talking about the current diagnosis practice in med uh, 
practices in medicine and the potential of uh, artificial intelligence to improve accuracy and efficiency uh, in, in medical diagnosis. So I think uh, I need to go a little fast. Uh, so oh well, uh, Muskan just message. She is not presenting. She is in a meeting with me. Okay. So you can take your time. Right. So in, uh, in the in the medical uh, diagnosis chapter, uh, he's like uh, talking about uh, current methods rely heavily on the expertise of individual healthcare providers. So they are, uh, for example, if you are going to patient like any any physician, then we need to rely on their expertise, like uh, what they encounter uh, encountered with a different uh, uh, patient and uh, their experience expertise. Uh, but if we have, let's say. Uh, 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 AI with uh, like many different uh, data set and trend model, then we can just provide the information to physician. Okay, these are the possibilities uh, as well. So, so, so that is what discussed in this particular chapter. And uh, so, improve diagnostic accuracy by analyzing large uh, amounts of data. Uh, and then he is also like talking about important. Uh, ethical consideration such as potential for bias and need for transparency in algorithm development and use and he's suggesting like okay proper uh, a very good strategy to mitigate those things and uh, uh, so if we talk about like okay so not all the medical information uh, available explicitly uh, so he's talking about that point uh, that as well so I think we talked about a lot about the implicit entity thing, right? Uh, so uh, that is also he discussed, okay, so for some diseases, which is not uh, explicitly mentioned in the data, but we need to, like model is to identify, okay, this is the, these are the conditions or diseases uh, is there. And there is a myoclinic uh, study as well, looked at the 300, uh, uh, consecutive patients uh, referred and the second opinion diagnosis agreed with the referred physician diagnosis is only 12 percent of the patient is this apples to apples though i'm worried about this so usually a primary care physician will say gee i think you better see a neurologist or i think you better see an orthopedist and you go to the orthopedist and the orthopedist says no nah, i really think it's the neurologist problem so is it is it that kind of situation where there's a disagreement um, or is it, you know, orthopedist one says this and orthopedist two says that? What is this? Right. So uh, in the book, they have only mentioned uh, two different physicians, not specifically like, okay, this is the uh, uh, specialist or P, uh, yeah. PCP, uh, general medicine. But uh, yeah, so this is the, the myoclinic study. And maybe uh, uh, we can go to that particular study and, and, and have a look. Yeah. I'd just be a little bit, I, I don't think it's that bad <laughs> between specialists. That's why he talked about all these different challenges, like what is happening currently and uh, why there is a need. Uh, so even for the in the healthcare domain, so he is talking about this personalized thing and uh, uh, like creating a, a large model uh, to predict the, the diagnostic and all the other information. But in a real scenario, he is also talking about okay, this is very difficult in healthcare because. Uh, uh, data privacy issues who owns data right so that is also a major issue in uh, in in this uh, yeah. uh, healthcare system right so uh, he's also talking about those stuff uh, but uh, yeah so uh, in in the summary he's talking about okay these these things are needed uh, to have the better uh, to have the better healthcare Uh, so he how is he defining better health better healthcare uh, all so see uh, all this information are represented right so uh, the uh, mortality rate uh, uh, life expectancy uh, with the expenditure right so uh, so these are the measurements no the, those are the metrics but what is the so because he showed a bunch of other oecd countries mm -hmm. those don't have ai how is their cost lower right Right, right, right. So why is he saying the solution is AI and not their model? He's and talking in terms of personalized healthcare, I guess. Uh -huh. He's talking in terms of personalized healthcare, whatever chapter I have read. Like. Okay. 
like better health care is better health care and uh, see the cost is uh, uh, high uh, because there are uh, so many parties involved just for like one patient if you see there are so many different parties involved and uh, they need to give money to everyone and so, the management is messed up what, what he is explaining in this book have you read you read this yeah. one too yeah I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for you to tell me about all the sociocultural issues that are underneath all of this. And I'm afraid you're not going to get there. Not you personally, but I mean, I'm afraid the book just so. Yeah. So uh, in hearing what this is, what, where this is going to go. <laughs> AI is the issue why American doctors charge so much. Right. That's that's really. Why American doctors yes, charge so why? much, right? Why? So they, see, they, they, they do not want to charge so much. Uh, but if uh, you see the entire system, they need to pay to different uh, people, right? So at the end, they need to earn some money. No, so they no here's the problem. This is my opinion. I don't know if it's the book. Yeah. But the no, uh, problem is that people who go into medical school pay for their own education here. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, and, and it, you walk out of medical school, depending upon your specialty, with something like $300,000 of debt. Yes. So your throughput, given all these people who are grabbing money from the visit charge, your throughput has to be really high in order to start paying down that loan. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that is a really important part of what's causing the physicians to optimize and bend patients and to once get them are, through fast. Once they are graduated, their in interest rate started. All right, that, uh, that part I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, right, right, right. so why is medical cost of education that high? Because uh, here in America, they are, they just go, they just don't do like a theoretical study, right? They have everything, machines and all, from the starting of first year. There's and there's that, there's other there's other pressures on the system, and I and you know consistent with Ahmed's concerns, we want to be thinking about how this influences the personalization problems. Uh, but there's lots of um, legal issues and uh, legal risks that the doctors are also responding to here. So if you miss something, you're gonna get sued potentially. And so they have to pay uh, for so it, so liability like insurance, in this et cetera. They also mentioned that Did there it? is one incident, like uh, just an example came to my mind. Uh, there was one incident in which like uh, two doctors were there and they have a like, disagreement in their diagnosis mm -hmm. so there was like a proper team which came and said and this all will include costs and all this thing that's why medical charges are very very high because that will include the time of those people who come and uh, inquire them also mm -hmm. these are examples yeah, are this, this, this so currently is... they are like spending uh, if you like see that table in 1975 and current so initially they are spending like uh, about an hour with the patient, but currently they are spending about 15-20 uh, minutes uh, as hmm. that table, 15-20 minutes. And even with 15-20 minutes, they are like reviewing the data for let's say 12-13 uh, minutes and just spending 3-4 uh, minutes with the patient. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, so in that particular table in in the book, what they uh, what author is saying like okay, uh, we can save that time. So we can save that 12 minutes by providing the summary or the historical data on those stuff and providing also the, 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 the possibilities and everything. Right? Yeah, but, but don't, don't forget this legal liability piece. It's really important. If the outcome turns out to be bad, your defense is I follow standard practice. This, this, right. was, this is the general way that this problem should be treated. Mm -hmm. So as you go down this personalization path, you do need to consider the legal implications of that and how in, in the current culture. Mm -hmm. So how would that change? Uh, let's say there was an AI developed which is assisting a doctor. And at this point, if we take students itself, we tend to go back to chat GPT, type our questions, get answers, mm -hmm. and blindly take what it says. Mm -hmm to a majority of the mm -hmm. like percentage. Uh, what do you, what you're yeah. saying, majority of students ask chat GPT? Not a majority, I'm saying that is feasible. So okay. since the AI is I there, mean, if you see the content which chat GPT is generating, I don't feel that it's 100% correct. 
Yeah. It's, well, without that, I, I'm just worried about the personalization any, thing. Yeah. So, so if there is an AI out? that is introduced into the system, uh, and it gives out a decision which the doctor is blindly following, who would be uh, liable? Right. So that's, certainly, that's an that's issue. That's why they want explainability yeah. and interpretability both here. But even so, even in the mental health stuff, what you guys are doing when you justify your in interventions or you evaluate the safety of your interventions, you do it with respect to standard yes. practice. Yes. That is always the touchstone that you can imagine. Yeah, if this problem also exists in the US, it's a legal system also. Whether somebody can fail or not, there are mm -hmm. systems and you know, software which decide, even judges, you know, you know, hold <coughs> that software says they take a person and so on. So yeah, I mean, maybe it's, it's the cultural system of this country. I don't know. Yeah, why this happened? They still use the same system, even though a lot of research has come. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, so bias. there are studies which clearly says that basically it talks about color and age. Yeah. If you are black and if you are you know young, you tend to do more crime. So I will not give you blame. Yes. That's that's a that's a system. Is. One uh, very. Um, if there's a time, we'll discuss, uh, you know, conversations you guys are having on our uh, Google chat. Um, oh, yeah. But, um, you know, um, if uh, you're asking for medical advice, um, do you think the doctor is using the data from all over the world in arbitrary way to decide? No, right? Not currently, yeah. Well, no, but he should not. There's a lot of junk out there. Yeah. Right, right, right. right. There'll be some social media posts that you be <laughs> or uh, GPT-4 is trained on, right? <laughs> no, I'm not talking about the social media. If it's just the patient reports, which is like already there in the... Uh, no, but patient reports, uh, you know, there are a lot of patient reports that will be error on us. Yeah, but if you, if, you are, if you are talking about large data, so those things will be ignored by the model, right? So the point here is that when you make a choice or decision, you want to rely on trustworthy data. Mm. You want to rely on person with the right expertise to interpret that data. Mm. And, and a lot more, just think through that, right? You are relying on a doctor to help you diagnose and treat you. Doctor is relying on his education. He or her education, doctor is rely on uh, the medical, uh, you know, clinical uh, practice guideline. Mm -hmm. The doctor is rely on experience, mm -hmm. insight, and doctor is rely on other things like quote unquote bedside manner or how you ask the question or things like that. A lot of things that you know, right? Mm -hmm. What part of this chat GP does? <laughs> or GP does? <laughs> no. So when you when you say you're going to use AI, uh, you know, generative AI. Which will pick data from here and here and here and pick the side. <laughs> and say, and listen, I mean, it's just not going to be there reliably. Right? Even on the simple things, suppose I wanted to know about a person. I would rely, I would say I rely on this uh, you know Wikipedia page. It's edited by people, it is being marked as no problem on the page. I rely on that as authority page. If the if the journey AI system is getting the data from multiple sources and putting together the grids well, are you going to relearn that? No, it's not. The technical report says that uh, GPT-4 is not supposed to be used for uh, sensitive issues such as medical care. No, are we done with this? Then we'll jump. <laughs> <laughs> I have what to say. <laughs> finish, finish your presentation. <laughs> Okay. So uh, the uh, the question in the book that I'm not understanding is where is AI fitting? I'm hearing problems with cost of school, okay, mm -hmm. medical school, so uh, and a uh, terrible system, and they're trying to uh, cover each other in costs, and then they're looking to other OECD countries that have somehow done it right. So the, we are like this is just an introduction part and. This is the second chapter. Okay. Like, uh, oh, in the second chapter? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so in the uh, like uh, in the later slide, I uh, uh, I have also mentioned uh, about uh, a different uh, specific narrow uh, diagnostic thing where the 
there are current uh, algorithms are available for let's say i or specific uh, domain and uh, uh, like how they are performed and uh, so what uh, he is talking about okay so let's say we have uh, a model for let's say for uh, radiology to predict the uh, pneumonia or, or, or other diagnosis right so so that is one thing but then we need to uh, have a model for let's say uh, mri study or those kind of stuff right then uh, uh, we need uh, models for let's say uh, understanding the symptoms and then providing the okay what are the different diagnoses that can be there for this particular patient so from the chief complaints uh, we can predict the diagnosis no, so you, uh, the so thing, most of the thing is uh, the system has created a problem mm -hmm. and they're saying we'll use ai to solve the problem we have created instead of not creating that problem <laughs> yeah that's perhaps a better idea that is uh, something i'm not understanding <laughs> can you can you repeat it i, I don't uh, we have all these algorithms to decide how to build things to go through this complex uh, organizational structure instead of just streamlining the structure yeah. that's what fix uh, the root cause oh, yeah. okay so he complained many things about the healthcare system AI, yeah but he is saying that for everything we cannot use ai but there are certain things where we can use ai like uh, I just remember ECG reprocessing task over there. I guess it's in third chapter. Yeah, so I have that. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead. Then. So uh, in, in ECG, what what they have talked about? Uh, so uh, I think uh, they have mentioned one company. They have hired a Google researcher, and then they want to do the research on ECG as well as the potassium. Arthmia. How, how you can predict the, the potassium level and uh, predict the irregular heart rhythm? Mm. And then they have uh, they did some study, and uh, uh, so then uh, they have, so he mentioned in the Apple Watch. Now you can see okay now mm -hmm. uh, you can uh, they can predict irregular heart rhythms uh, and uh, uh, the the ECG as well in the just the watch. This this seems like a very narrow siloed interpretation of what you guys can do. In my okay. opinion, based on mm -hmm. you know the. The studies that I've done in the emergency room and in intensive care medicine, the problem, as well as being a patient, the problem is comorbidity, mm. right? It's not, it's not what do I do? What's the standard of care for a person with heart failure? It's what's the standard of care for a person with heart failure who also has kidney disease, who also has orthopedic problems, who also has whatever, because the drugs and the treatments and the diagnoses, the diagnostic processes, all interact because of comorbidities. Mm -hmm. So this just doesn't. This just seems kind of um, superficial. I would be look, I, if I were looking at personal health care problem, I would be worried about the comorbidity issue and trying to do something about that. So that is one issue, right? And there are many more uh, different issues, and uh, we can. Uh, if you if you are uh, talking about the narrow uh, uh, thing then uh, there are many different uh, 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 many many specific things that we can we can uh, apply the ai or improve the uh, that system right and then uh, think about like okay consolidate all the different thing uh, the improvement and then uh, the all these things provided to let's say physician or uh, at, at the time of the patient care then uh, the result will be uh, very different. Yeah, but but be careful about how you guys are formulating the personalization problem. If you're thinking that you're going to add up neurology and orthopedics and gastroenterology mm -hmm. and hematology, it probably isn't going to look like it probably is the right model. System will fail. Huh? System will fail. You, it will fail. And so, you know, in this group, I encourage you to kind of look ahead and see what the personalization problems are going to be and i would say it's the interaction of these siloed disciplines that you should mm -hmm. be paying attention moreover i would say that one of the biggest faults of the american healthcare system is in fact this silo mm -hmm. um, um i guess it's called specialty care second uh, secondary mm -hmm. care I mean, yeah, when you're in hospital, uh, there will be uh, different doctors coming by. Uh, they do spend a lot of time reading each other notes. So if they are good, 
in the current system, they would read the notes and they are very informed. So yeah. Then this will come and then neurologists will come in the yeah. case of Farouk, yeah. for example. And they, uh, compared to the time they spend with you, they spend 10 times more time uh, reading, uh, going over yeah. report and getting the back Then they come and see you. Yeah. But so, uh, yeah. so there is no guarantee that, um, you know, the information flows over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to make some medical change or you want to ask for, you know, reducing or increasing dose. Um, it, it, it goes to nurse and then you talk to the doctor, comes back. Uh, one doctor may talk to another doctor. That whole process is complicated. Yeah. Uh, maybe sometimes it's done well and sometimes it does not. Uh, this time, we are very lucky where we thought we got very good care. When my father was in, uh, you know, hospital, uh, there was, you know, quite a bit of terrible situation. So it all depends. Uh, the uh, one very well known study is that um, the uh, patients who were um, uh, admitted to hospital for cardiology issues, cardiac uh, problems, uh, were getting some uh, very poor outcomes. Many are dying or, or getting significantly hurt. And uh, analysis showed that, that those were all related to the same patient being seen by also gastroenterologist. Uh, mm -hmm. And that uh, what happened is that the medication given by mm -hmm. uh, gastroenterologist uh, yep. uh, had a severe interaction with the heart there you go. Uh, thing. And um, uh, now uh, the, the gastroenter, you know, who has the responsibility to you know, avoid these uh, conditions. Uh, so the gastroenterologist does not care about what has happened to your heart. Mm. And that's the problem. Yep. It has, does not have enough knowledge, does not, you know, the, and the, uh, for the doctors to talk to each other is very hard. It has to be done through the notes or they have to put on the phone, it's very hard. Yeah. And they are not gathered, they are not, you know, discussing anything together, yeah. which can leave a lot of things out. So what I'm seeing here, so, uh, I think he has mentioned in the in the introduction part, but uh, about about the current healthcare system. So right now, so why uh, uh, that uh, specific physician is looking at only uh, their uh, particular thing, right? So they are uh, incentivized based on the uh, okay, this is the problem, and uh, I have treated this patient with this, but not the holistic view, right? Mm -hmm. the, if uh, like patient have let's say the other condition or uh, may increase the uh, the blood pressure or, or, or anything right then they will go to another physician but uh, if we have the model uh, where uh, so th they are talking in in value based care they have the fixed amount right so this is the patient based on the historical data he has let's say diabetes he has a heart attack once and uh, these are the different conditions uh, the, right. <laughs> the coronary conditions and based on the the, the chronic conditions they are uh, identifying one score so this is the risk score for let's say x patient and uh, based on the risk score they are uh, assigning one amount okay for this patient we will give let's say twenty thousand dollar a year yeah but amit's point who's re who's responsible so see now now uh, <laughs> if you <It's> wrong intuition <laughs> <laughs> well so somebody has to somebody has to take responsibility for ironing out the interactions so so now if you think other uh, so uh, in a different direction so for example i am a physician we three are a, let, let's say physician and we are getting uh, twenty thousand dollar for this patient right so uh, and our goal is to like save the money like how to get more money uh, uh, out of twenty thousand dollars right so what we will do we will uh, uh, like uh, treat a patient in a way that uh, uh, he or she needs to know, like uh, there is no need to come back for that patient and we will uh, look at all the different condition and we will treat in a in a better way right so that the there is no major condition then the, uh, they cannot come back to us uh, again and again for the treatment and that's how uh, uh, we will get the money out of 20 dollars but if they come again and again you'll get more money right? no no no, no. no. So, it's so, a big <laughs> Well, that is the difference between the uh, uh, the traditional model of uh, a service based model and the value based model. So I'll give you a very specific example. Uh, I had a you know project we were working with uh, uh, William, uh, what is his last name? Uh, the chief of cardiology at Ohio State University's Wexel Medical School. 
And it was similar to our Asthava project where we had mobile app and uh, sensors. One of the, uh, so uh, in, uh, this was, uh, the data is about 10 years old, but it costs US medical system $17 billion a year due to the re-hospitalization of chronic heart patient. 49% um, of the patient, 49% patient get readmitted for the heart condition within six months and 25% patient get readmitted for heart patient or chronic heart patient which had heart surgery, 25% patient get readmitted in one month. And that transfers 70 billion dollars. So this is the known thing. Now uh, we discuss a case example. This patient it was admitted to the uh, hospital six times in a year. The patient was, uh, you know, um, did not have a house. So he was kind of guy on the street or something. And for him, the hospital was a nice day, getting, you know, warm food, all the care and everything, right? So for him, coming to hospital was no, never a hesitation. And uh, he, uh, you know, hospital has to provide the care by the law. Uh, and, um, you know, a, a, and uh, he doesn't probably, I don't think he had insurance also. And uh, then what was found, but, but here, for every time the patient came in, uh, at least for the doctor, what happens to hospital is fine, but the doctor who treats, he gets paid for service because he's, he's uh, you know, doing the operation, he's whatever medical procedure, he gets paid. Okay. Hospital may be required, but that's a different issue, right? So there's no incentive for the doctor to ensure that the guy does not come back. Eventually it was found that this patient was uh, in this uh, information was in the note by the social worker, not the medical professional, that the patient was abusing uh, drugs. Now, whatever you may do with your heart, if you're going to abuse the drug once you abuse, he's going to come, you're going to come back with that kind of medical condition. Secondly, the patient did not have, uh, you know, the, uh, the caregiver, somebody looking after him, right? Uh, you know, uh, my wife had an excellent care somebody always there with her, all the, you know, the, the, the caretakers, right? So the outcome is very different, right? If you're alone and trying to manage the outcome is very bad, same medical condition, right? So, but, so service-based thing is not good because there's no incentive. You get paid for every time you give the thing. The value-based care is saying, I'm going to give you fixed price for the patient. Although I don't know why there should be insurance company for that. <laughs> because they are really not doing anything, just taking the money, taking 30% off <laughs> to the doctors. Because, uh, so what is happening? CMS, uh, like, so they have a limited people, right? So they cannot scale uh, with uh, so many people. So they have, for example, X uh, uh, patients uh, under uh, Medicare and, uh, and uh, Medicaid. Then, so what they are doing, they are okay. Uh, so basically, outsourcing. Yeah. Okay, you get the for the patient. You can get uh, the insurance from any uh, insurance provider, but uh, at then we will pay to them, and they will manage your entire thing. Fixed cost, but anyway, what yeah. yeah, is that? It is a fixed. What is that? Too many people. Yes. The thing, as opposed to you know, in the US, uh, the insurance uh, co company uh, take away at least thirty percent. Okay, so uh, for every hundred dollars, you get the care for maximum seventy dollar. Uh, the rest is going for non-medical purposes. It is reasonably expectable that you have 10% overhead cost. Uh, in uh, other countries would have that. For the national services that have, they would have that kind of cost. But in US, because of the insurance company and the, uh, the, the, the hospital CEOs and the pharmacies, they get very hard. For, their typical packages are 30 million a year. That's a typical, 30 million a year. That's the typical effect, you know, uh, income. Anyway, so with the uh, value-based care, you are going to, here is the medical condition, you're going to get so much money. <coughs> now, if the doctor patient is readmitted, it costs you, um, uh, you know, $50, uh, five hundred dollars per readmission, uh, roughly $8,000 a day times, uh, you know, five or six days. That is how you get, you know, this number. Um, so, uh, you lose money if you're getting paid $75,000 for this patient and the patient gets readmitted once. CMS, 
uh, change the rule saying that every time there is an intuition, we'll pay you less money to incentivize production of reestablishing. And that would lead to holistic care. Now, the cost of giving some, uh, you know, thing to get, make sure that this person who is released from her, you know, thing gets some shelter and food is far less than the cost of him coming to the hospital twice more, right? So then people will think of holistic care, which is what is necessary, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, um, uh, study shows that um, any patient that does not have a family structure, social support, uh, I have poor outcome. They don't take medication in time or take medication at all. If they can't afford the medication, you are given medication when you leave the hospital, but then nobody is there to take care of medication. If I can't afford for the medication, it's going to come back. But all cost of suicide is very high. So in the US, what is the number? Uh, 80 or 90 percent of the total cost is uh, due to the end of life situation. And uh, you know, so chronic care conditions and end of life. These are the wow, you know, biggest costs. The uh, routine cost of going doctor is a small percentage of all the costs. But if that is done well, you can really cut down all these things. Anyway, let's go to. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, so. Uh, I think we are discussing uh, uh, since long time, and, and so so that is what the the summary uh, of, of this uh, particular book, right? So no, there was a, well, this book has an excellent uh, example of AI. Yeah, uh, example is there. So, yeah, so. Uh, so there are so many slides for different example use cases so uh, so here in this particular chapter he is talking about different uh, tools for uh, symptom uh, symptom checker so one is uh, is able symptom checker uh, covers more than 6000 diseases so that is one tool then so assessment report published in british medical journal assessed 23 different symptom checker and only 34% had the correct uh, diagnosis so these are the different uh, uh, study articles that they have discussed in the book. And uh, uh, so current system uh, incorporate components of artificial intelligence, uh, but not uh, shown to simulate the accuracy of diagnosis made by doctor. So that is also uh, uh, discussed. And uh, uh, so there are, uh, so he's talking about, there are uh, some uh, other system, which is like, the, they are not only asking about uh, the symptom, but they are also asking about the series of questions like uh, the patient health history and uh, other uh, like other than symptoms. And based on the health history and the symptoms, they are they are predicting the diagnosis. What, what does the error analysis look like? So this is miserable, you know, success rate. But what, what kind of what's the source of the problem? Why why are these systems doing so? Uh, are you talking about the second point? Because of the outliers. Outliers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does the book also uh, talk about using uh, utilizing the data present in these uh, uh, medical publications? I guess he talked about. So in in at the end they have talked about everything, all the data that you can consolidate and uh, you can make the AI virtual <sighs> system, and then you can uh, predict uh, for the particular patient and by that way you can improve the the patient care and reduce the time as well mm, you know we should at, at least revisit Kaushik's question which is what does it mean to provide good care and the implicit definition here is correct diagnosis, correct uh, diagnosis. but if you deal with doctors that's not really where their head is at their head is at quality of life and maintaining quality of life Quality of life of whom? Uh, of, <laughs> of the patient. Uh, exactly. you know, a, a, a benevolent physician is worried about um, that. I mean, there's Perhaps. another assumption here, and that's that you know all misdiagnoses of patients are equal. And you can think about like, you know, obviously there are really critical examples of misdiagnosis, for example, deciding whether or not somebody has cancer, but there are a lot more sort of subtle examples where, you know, maybe somebody is, um, 
you know, like certain skin conditions, for example, like, you know, you misdiagnose the patient with a slightly different skin condition. However, the treatment for those two things are the exact same or very similar. And so arguably, you know, those are sort of, you know, on our confusion matrix, we care a whole lot less about those than we do about sort of like the big, uh, you know, the big obvious errors. And so, you know, I feel you need to sort of factor that kind of thing into your analysis because, you know, I think a lot of physicians um, are a lot more focused on, you know, are we in the correct ballpark and are we doing the right treatment than do I have the precise name attached to this patient's condition? So the, the, the evaluation criteria, the objective really does need to be specified here. And I do take issue with a strict diagnostic bin <laughs> as the criterion. That is way more fast. Huh? That is way more fast. So hard or fast? Yeah, far. Fast? Far. 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 Oh, far. Yeah. Well, yeah. But, you know, but the job here is to support physicians. And, and I don't think this goal of um, maintaining quality of life is a, a bad goal, right? We don't think that's a bad thing. <laughs> So if we want to support the physicians in, in doing that, we might need to rethink the way we're conceptualizing the objectives. Let me quickly go through all the slides and then I think we can debate. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, we'll, uh, uh, so this is the, uh, I think different uh, 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 narrow eye diagnostic. Yeah. And he's talking about the progress uh, with different data sets like okay, in brain, uh, now uh, the AI can understand uh, uh, the scan interpretation for stroke patient, for heart disease. Uh, the system can now understand the accurate uh, interpretation of electrocardiograms. And uh, so these are the like cancer, eye disease. So for cancer, uh, uh, system can diagnose the skin lesions and pathology slides as well. Uh, uh, for the eye disease, uh, processing retinal uh, images accurately. So I have, uh, I think, a specific uh, slide for IDCs as well as the mm -hmm. for the radiology. And uh, I was like surprised with the IDCs. I, I, I don't know, like, oh, we can do uh, this many things with uh, retinal images. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting because yeah. I had, because of my, I had a lot of additional exam. Yeah. But none of the doctors seem to be using, uh, you know, this kind of uh, techniques and tools on the data. Oh, on the data. They just looked at the images? Yeah, this is looking at the images, yeah. you know, visually and interpreting it rather than having, you know, supported by this. Mm -hmm. Because studies do show that, uh, you know, this can, in radiology, they can find a lot more possibilities. Now, doctors should look at the results that the AI tool gives you and rule in or rule out, but, uh, the, you know, uh, they're not using it. By the way, this is a very interesting thing. Uh, right. So today, you guys know of Veen, right? Uh, my former student. Yes. So Veen arranged for me to listen to a, a talk given by um, a hospital, an oncology hospital in Vietnam. <laughs> I had to listen to it. You know, uh, what time was it? <laughs> no, it was 10 a.m. my time. So, okay. <laughs> but there was a doctor, there was a you know, medical professional and all this stuff, and, and, and a software engineer. And uh, that was all about breast cancer detection, yeah. you know, and that work has been studied quite a bit. Uh, you know, a uh, lot of people have published on that issue, uh, mm -hmm. tumor detection or whatever. But um, anyway, it was very interesting. Even the last two part here, the IDCs and the audio waveform of a cough uh, uh, can be used to uh, assist uh, the diagnosis of asthma, tuberculosis, and other mm -hmm. things. That is very. Uh, yeah, so what happens is that. There is so much uh, work that scientists have done, um, and there's so, so much uh, you know, promise, but its adoption in healthcare is extremely slow, and the typical time is 10 to 15 years, uh, that, and that will be fast. The, the two reasons, uh, one is that there is no monetary incentive, and the second reason is that um, you have to demonstrate um, through uh, you know prospective trial uh, that uh, the um, it's so so just some sort of technical improvement uh, AUC this this is don't work 
uh, you have to do a basically clinical trial or blind trial uh, where um, uh, you know the current way of doing and the new way of doing are compared. Uh, so in 1984, 1984, we have published a study in uh, the journal Pediatrics where um, we were uh, we developed a system called CATCH, reading uh, remotely reading echocardiogram. Um, you know, and compare it with uh, the, the state of the art was to send in a tape, record it by machine and stand in tape, and the specialist reads that. Now, in the whole state of Georgia, there are only 10 pediatric echograph, you know, uh, uh, pediatric uh, people who can read pediatric echographs. Uh, now, with, with internet delivery of the data, you can instantly get the data and, 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 and read it. You're still reading it, you know. Uh, this is the transformation mechanism solution. We did the blind study of the state of the art and this thing and published it. And that can be the basis for then somebody has to take an issue to argue uh, that to be able to charge uh, for this new method. Mm. And the insurance company has to agree. So see, that is all the process. Mm -hmm. the, the biggest uh, you know, you know, improvement in healthcare came because of COVID. All the places where telehealth could not be used is now allowed to be used. So, Doctor said the charge that the insurance company has to agree to, there are auxiliary charges, right? You will need user experience designers to facilitate communication between the AI and a human. Then you will need uh, to train the entire legal team on ethics issues that arise. So, auxiliary charges are far outweighing the cost of just building the AI technology, even if they agree to that. Yeah, all the, all the in this particular we are, we are just using internet technology for the delivery of the data online as opposed to, to uh, tape by FedEx overnight. So uh, nothing changed. Uh, you're still the, you know playing the video, echocardiogram, you know, the video uh, of the terminal and the you know the reader are using writing the report. Okay. So whether you're playing from the tape that has come in or the tape machine. Or internet offered data doesn't make difference, right? And in this book as well, like uh, they talked about uh, the need and the training to teach as well. So once, let's say, we introduce uh, all these AI methods in the in the practice, then uh, we need to train them. So it, uh, basically, the idea is this is not uh, to replace you. So uh, it's a clear message, right? So it, it, these systems are uh, not uh, there to replace you. This is just to help. you. So uh, that message that we, we need to convey as well as we need to train them to like uh, better utilization of this uh, uh, different models. So uh, here uh, in this uh, in this chapter, uh, so uh, liability is associated with the use of uh, artificial intelligence uh, discussed. So if we talk about uh, uh, so these are the the, the major uh, topic that uh, uh, that was discussed. Uh, so neural network methodology and limits. So uh, he was talking about uh, uh, in the uh, current healthcare practice we have like too many unstructured data, and uh, so with the unstructured data to uh, uh, to get the meaningful information. Uh, talked about the supervised learning unsupervised learning and the uh, label data set and then uh, we had talked about the data derived and the model performance issue as well uh, then uh, he talked about the, about the black boxes uh, uh, so so in uh, in the black boxes i think he uh, he mentioned about uh, a few examples and this is one of them like electro Convulsive therapy is highly effective in uh, several depression uh, disorders, uh, but no one knows how how it is working, right? But still, people are accepting. Okay, if this is working, then it is okay. Uh, uh, and he talked about he mentioned one example. Let's say uh, there is one black box system which is 99% accurate, and there is explainable system which is at the 80% accurate. Uh, still, people will go with 99% uh, accurate system. So, uh, and I, I, he has given one an, another example uh, by, uh, so Deep Dream, uh, I think by Google, they have launched around in 2015 or 16. So that particular algorithm uh, 
So reverse the deep learning deep algorithm. Yeah. Huh? What is the connection of deep brain with tensor? No, no, no. He was talking about black boxes. So uh, he was talking about deep, different aspects. Uh, so deep uh, deep dream is a reverse deep learning algorithm. Oh, yeah. So from the outcome, uh, the algorithm is predicting the different features. Right. So uh, those kind of stuff. Like okay, uh, there are uh, system available, uh, and uh, so he is talking about okay this is needed uh, but this is not needed as well like for some cases it is needed for some cases it is not needed and these are the systems where people have worked on so those do, do stuff and uh, uh, in uh, so again uh, he talked about the, the bias as well like uh, in google photo ai i think 2015 uh, mistakenly tagged uh, uh, black people as gorillas and uh, so so those issues and the name prism uh, uh, inferred uh, uh, ethnicity and nationality from a name so they did not anticipate that the app would be used to promote uh, the discrimination but uh, it was so uh, so those uh, things that uh, he has mentioned uh, in this particular uh, different uh, uh, topics and the blurring of truth. Uh, so he was talking about the fake news, images, speech, videos, and how people are using in different, uh, uh, like e election and uh, the other uh, thing. He was also uh, uh, like talked about privacy and hacking, the face ID, fingerprint, and in future retinal images, electrocardiograms can also be used uh, to uh, in uh, in this particular privacy and hacking. And then he talked about this ethics and public policy. So uh, he talked about this uh, example, uh, which is, I think, very famous. So there is no uh, specific answer, like uh, what should uh, we do for these three particular conditions. So in A, so who will, like, uh, you will save uh, several people. And then if you want to save them, you will uh, kill one uh, the other person. Or uh, so those kind of in, in B, you want to save this or you want to like so this is the example of driverless car so you want to save your driver or the people right so and there is no uh, right answer to these questions because of the the moral issues and uh, those stuff so he was talking about this just just an anecdote to this there's a nice indian web series uh -huh. they actually say you know show this kind of thing so you know driverless car being in, i mean the futuristic got introduced in india and it is going to an accident. Then obviously legal system come into picture. The question is who is you know at the fault over here? So the storyline is fantastic. Exactly and this one. Okay. I think we should pass this kind of stuff. I mean, you know, we talk about the time, so there's nothing new here. Let's just focus on something that is novel. So this is a, a book, right? So the, so the author yeah, well, discussed uh, all, so all of these examples. Yeah, let, uh, let's not discuss people. the examples that uh, you come across in other times. Let's focus on the most important AI thing. This, this we have heard all the time. Yeah, then uh, we can. Uh, Is there anything else? Yeah, or, you know, let me, let me go through the uh, slide and maybe uh, the important things that we can go through. Mm -hmm. So this is about the chest X-ray and how uh, the AI system is like predicting different things. And this is uh, about uh, the skin cancer algorithms and how uh, this algorithm is like uh, got the uh, very good results compared compared to the physician. And then. Uh, this is uh, uh, interesting to me. Like this is the retinal images and predict the key matrix. Like okay, from the retinal images, uh, they are predicting age and gender, uh, uh, then uh, smoking status, blood pressure, adverse outcomes, uh, all of this uh, from the only the retinal images. Can I just ask you to go back to the last slide? Just a quick question. Where's ground truth come from? So they have. Uh, so they have. Uh, uh, the physicians who did so they so this is a study yeah. so uh, so with the same examples uh, i think uh, how many uh, physicians were there around uh, i don't remember the exact number but there are like many physicians that they have studied and this is the average so if you see the average uh, auc for physician as well as the average auc for algorithm yeah but but where does the gram truth come from it's not coming from the physicians so where is it coming from It is. It is. They are labeling the data. Yeah, they're labeling the data, but you're saying that 
that the positions are not as so good the, as the machines. There are, so there let me give an example. Yeah. Today in our uh, you know discussion, you know, the breast cancer example, their ground truth is coming from biopsy. Biopsy. Okay. So radiologists are there. There is a radiologist who can identify possibly a cancerous tissue. Mm -hmm. There is a um, uh, AI algorithm that can identify okay. cancerous tissue or that thing, suspected part. But the ground truth is, is the biopsy. Okay, so convergent evidence is basically what. Yeah, so it doesn't, doesn't even matter if the radiologist found or not. It's actually okay. You know, thanks. Can, can I go back to the retina image? I have a, I have a very critical question here. So basically, you were saying that people would be able to, you know, predict age, gender, and various other factors from retinal images. Mm -hmm. Is it is it kind of you know scientific? See, I'm let me let me you know put my question this way. So I have a similar discussion with some time ago. So let's say a zodiac sign. A lot of people believe, right? And mm -hmm. I can I can collect a lot of data, zodiac sign of people and their social media. You know how they interact in social media. I can create a you know, neural network system which can predict somebody zodiac sign, and <laughs> I could be eighty percent correct. <clears throat> but uh, I mean, is it scientific? I mean, I can I can predict okay, somebody's. So, so here, what happens that many a times mm -hmm. uh, people have accidents, mm -hmm. and there they have no information about the person who met with an accident until and unless somebody came from their mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. So until then, they have to go with certain things. I certain see. procedures this is for you know kind of uh, ad hoc service yeah ad hoc service and to improvise those like clinical applications okay yeah and uh, uh, i will uh, <laughs> I, I, I said with you, you know the most interesting thing i you know i remember from this uh, book he discusses a particular um, um, case uh, of um, analysis of ECG and that um, there is a particular part of the ECG that is considered to be informative for heart condition mm -hmm. and that uh, the, a, the machine learning engineers, uh, you know, and the team decided that we'll focus on that and evaluate that part of the data and not all the data, that other data that is supposed to be not meaningful. And that got very bad results and the uh, approach which in most entire data get much better result, which is counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. Saying, let us focus on informative data, useful data. Humans believe this data will be more useful. Let's use it and, uh, you know, rather than incorporate what might be noise or uninformative data. Mm -hmm. And that was very, uh, you know, interesting uh, thing. And that is really worth reading, just that particular instance in this one. That is in chapter three. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, they discussed about the ECG as well as the potassium, <laughs> yeah. the, the potassium thing. Huh? And so that, that is what yeah, they, is in, uh, in Apple Watch is like uh, they are predicting the irregular heart rhythms and those stuff yeah. that they have discussed. Yeah, so this is uh, about the virtual medical assistant. Uh, uh, so, uh, so probably this is the so they are comparing today and the, uh, what is today and uh, what is like what should be there uh, tomorrow? What should be there in a virtual medical assistant? So he talked. So this is the last slide uh, that we'll discuss, and then we can move to another talk. So uh, we can input all the different data set to uh, uh, the neural network and make a system so that it uh, uh, to make the virtual health uh, as assistant and uh, pro provide to the people and physicians. So so this is the. Uh, this is his vision. Huh? This is what he wants. Like. This is so this is the virtual about the virtual medical assistant. This is what he explained, but this is recently published somewhere, I guess. Not no, recently. But has the model been implemented, yeah. or is it just a vision? No, this is a vision. That he shared just a vision. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of issues here, right? I mean, uh, are you going to just dump all the data and somehow the machine will understand all of them, or are you going to? Uh, you know, treat different data separately and connect them in appropriate way where there is an appropriate, you know, reason for connection. These are the issues you don't understand very well. And my God, how much data would you need with all of these dimensions? <laughs> lot, lot, a lot. A lot of. So, so good. Thanks. I think we, we are done with the book, right? Yeah. So, um, uh, let's just very briefly, we have only uh, five minutes or uh, uh, so left. Um, Stop. Okay. Yeah. 
it was very um, uh, uh, i think uh, it was very good to see